Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario for May. Um, and uh, we're here to talk about sustainable development goals, origin, context, and perspectives. Uh, we're wel welcoming Ned Rava, who is with the um, SDG, with the Joint SDG Fund for today. Um, what we're gonna do is, uh, first I'm gonna have people type into the chat. Um, the uh, question of the day will be, uh, so, you know, if, if you haven't been on these uh, calls before, uh, we kind of introduce who we are uh, just briefly, and um, the question of the day will be, how much do you know about the SDGs? And that'll give us a bit of a feel uh, for, for the audience we have. Um, the, the session itself uh, is kind of a response to uh, the March call we had, um, and uh, what happened was that Ned was actually sending me messages in the background. Um, and uh, and saying uh, in effect, um, he, well, he's he's been immersed in this, <laughs> and so I said, okay, let's let's go down to some basics here, some basic questions about the SDGs. Uh, we'll have a conversation about it. The way we're going to approach this is uh, we're going to have three questions, and um, and so Ned is going to talk for a little bit, and then we'll pause, and we'll have people. Um, ask questions. I'll be moderating um, and we'll have a little conversation about that. And then we'll move on to the second question, have a discussion. And then the third question, after the third question, then it's kind of open field and I'll be moderating people. So if we could use a chat um, and uh, firstly, if people could uh, just type in, I'll pause for a minute. If people could type in um, uh, who you are and um, how much you know about the SDGs. Um, and after that, uh, we'll get going. Okay, we've got um, some responses coming in. So um, uh, I'm pleased to introduce um, Ned Rava. Uh, besides being a PhD in, uh, in um, political science, he also has a master design degree from the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at uh, OCAD U. And so he's um, not a stranger to many people um, in this group. Um, and uh, I'll just hand it over to you, Ned. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um... Thank, thank you very much, um, um, David, for, for you know, giving me this opportunity and uh, organizing this session. Um, indeed, I, I felt, but not only in this, this context, but I also felt in many different other uh, cases that there's, there's a, a little understanding of the, of the basics of the SDGs. I'm not saying that you know, people should, should really, you know. Hey, nigga, it's say, thick as fuck. I, I'll do all types of position for this nigga. I'm the catcher and the pitcher. I play all roles, uh, okay, nigga. Hold I'm on, an all-star. Uh, let's see. Okay. Sorry. No problem. So, um, I'm not saying that the people need to, to be kind of proficient in the, in the SDGs, but there's a lot of confusion. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of misinterpretation and, and also, um, just kind of wrong, uh, perspective on what the SDGs represent. Uh, so I thought that maybe it would be good to, to, you know, lay down some basics. And, and then have an open discussion, uh, which goes beyond. So those people who are not really, um, have not had the experience with the SDGs would, would hopefully be able to contribute uh, because we'll be discussing the, uh, the, you know, what do SDGs have with the uh, systems approach? What does it mean for Canadians and so on and so forth? And um, um, it's great to have Peter here. Um, Peter and I have been working with, um, also with Ryan, 
um, on, on, on some, some of the analysis. And actually, Peter, I'm going to show some of, some of the, uh, there's, there's a slide. Um, uh, I'm not going to show the results. We, we can, you know, share it separately, but, you know, at least indicating the, the, the kind of stuff that you uh, contributed to. Okay, so, so let's start. I think, uh, David, it's like 10-ish 10, 10 minutes, uh, first part, second part, third part, and then in between we have the discussion. But let, let's see. Let's play, play it by ear. So, um, okay. So the first part would be just uh, some background. And I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I'm going to emphasize things that I, I found um, uh, misleading for most people and also giving some context uh, for better understanding of the SDGs. So before the SDGs, um, there has been some attempts to uh, deal with uh, the issue of having global goals and when when I say goals, I, I you know it's it's very broad definition of what a goal is, um, but some sort of idea of what could be uh, identified and then reported on, meaning it, it's measurable uh, for at, at the global level. So before the SDGs, there were MDGs, but I also want to mention that one of the the the, the pioneers in in this uh, was UNICEF in the nineties. And that was, I mean, UNICEF is uh, known for its marketing and, and also some, some good work. But um, uh, UNICEF, uh, the, the head of UNICEF at some point came in and said, well, you know, we are doing all this kind of stuff, but we cannot properly report on it because we don't have proper KPIs. So it's very much, uh, you know, um, Taylorism in action. Um, and, and also the, the way that UNICEF started um, really um i shouldn't say simplifying but it is simplifying things to to the point of you know can a child of six years old understand what unicef is doing this kind of stuff but you know it brought unicef to the position today that it's probably one of the most um financially sustainable uh un agencies and and really kind of you know uh, being known um, all over the world so marketing plus you know being able to have measurable goals. So, so that, was a, that was a push. And then everyone was talking about, well, you know, we need to have some global agenda because most of the discussion on sustainable development, and of course, we can discuss the whole concept of sustainable development, whether it's really sustainable development or it's sustainable growth, or does it have anything to do with sustainability? But this whole idea was, was quite um, up in the air. So at some point um, in 2000, uh, the, the, the UN uh, agreed on the MDGs, uh, Millennium Development Goals. And you see the boxes that graphically then, you know, were adopted by the SDGs as well. There was an OECD report. But, but the whole point of this is that for the very first time, there were some global goals. However, they were not universal. So they were referring only to the so-called developing countries or the global south or whatever you want to call them. So, for instance, Canada was not part of the MDGs. Um, and uh, it, it put together environmental aspect with kind of social human development because previously sustainable development from the 80s was mostly seen through the lenses of environmental aspects. Um, so this was the first time to say, oh, when you talk about sustainable development, it's not only environment, it's also human social. But the economic part was, was missing. Um, and the progress on the MDGs was quite slow. But there was something interesting that happened in the last years, which then became known as acceleration. And that, that's a concept that we can also discuss. I know that there's a lot of pushback, and, and I tend to agree with that. But there's also some value in the fact that some countries really made huge progress in a very short period of time. Uh, so all of that uh, then led to um, a couple of other initiatives before the SDGs. Um, that there was something um, um, at the UN that was called delivering as one countries, that that was the idea to break down the silos, to have more systemic approach to integrated policy. And there was a fund that was, I was managing this fund um, uh, before the joint SDG fund. Uh, it was called delivering results together fund. And there was idea of catalytic funding. So not really providing only grants and, you know, paying for services and goods, but, you know, can, can you um, find a way to invest millions to mobilize billions and then trillions. I always felt that that, that was a very erroneous logic because the, the, the calculations were made um, um, taking into consideration that everyone should become Sweden or Norway. So how much would that cost times whatever 150, 200 countries exist in the world, uh, which I don't think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 
proper logic, and not least because the, this whole European welfare system is also uh, showing signs of some erosion and, and some, some cracking. And of course, there was the idea that the private sector should be coming in more uh, kind of substantively, paying for some of this um, development goals. So beyond the ESG and then, of course, beyond the CSR, which was mostly about branding. And then there was the idea of bringing in the economic parts. Now you have um, at, at, the, at the left uh, uh, corner, left hand side of this, you have three ways. And, and I think we, you know, this has been discussed so many times in this uh, community and, and, and in other uh, fora. But um, ideally, socially, environmental, economic would be the three circles that kind of, you know, uh, are one within the other. I mean, these pillars are you know, quite, quite meaningless. But unfortunately, most of the people who are involved in this, they just see it as the, uh, this kind of Venn diagram, which, which is very wrong, as we know. Uh, so, but there was the idea to put social, economic, and environmental together. And actually, this, this was... Um, um, not so much about the three pillars, it's, it was about the five Ps, which is people, meaning social mostly, uh, planning meaning environmental, prosperity, a nice word to, to say economic growth, uh, peace and justice, uh, and then partnerships. So this is the five Ps that, you know, used to be mentioned a lot, now less so, but they were at, at, at the foundation of the SDGs. And then they were really massive uh, consultations around post-2015 agenda, this is how it was called, to push for a multilateralism and, and have broad particip participation. I don't know the numbers, I forgot those, but I think there's you know, a couple of millions of people that participated either in person, in different uh, local country level, regional level consultations, or through surveys, but it was really massive. I'm, I'm not saying that it was a proper dialogue, it was not, it was more, mostly just you know, kind of harvesting uh, data and insight, but it was something that uh, made a lot of traction um, in, in uh, 2014, 15. Now, uh, before I get to the goals, just very briefly. Um, so there are seven people goals, so-called. So it's around poverty, hunger, health and well-being, education, uh, gender, uh, clean water and sanitation, and affordable and, and clean energy. And by the way, as we know, um, these kind of things are not only relevant uh, for developing countries, so-called developing countries. We have plenty of issues around these in, in Canada, um, even, I think, around clean water and sanitation. Um, and then there are five prosperity goals, which is economic goals or economic development, economic growth. Uh, but there's also, uh, you know, bits and pieces of things like responsible consumption and production, which I don't, I, you know, this is... And there's so-called orphan SDGs, which are the SDGs that no one really mentions or works on. And number 12 is one of the orphans. So no one really talks a lot about consumption, uh, responsible consumption and production. Even 11, uh, which is sustainable cities and communities, is not, is not in the focus. But reduce inequality uh, and, of course, decent jobs, decent jobs, not only jobs, uh, are, are really kind of in, in the focus. And then you have three planet goals. Uh, around climate action, life below water, and life on land. Uh, one, uh, peace and justice, um, uh, which is mostly around institutions, uh, rule of law, um, governance, and then we have one partnership. And partnership is really, uh, you know, partnerships, but also everything else that didn't fit anywhere else. So, for instance, mobilizing funding and financing is, is a target under the partnerships. Um, I, I forgot to say... Uh, Probably I want to say that later on. Uh, these goals, uh, some of those are really not goals. Um, uh, they are supposed to be means of implementation. I mean, 17 partnerships is definitely a means of implementation. Uh, but some of those are really uh, misleading. Uh, I think I have it on another slide, but just to mention it here. So it's nice to have these boxes, and, and they actually misrepresent the SDGs because they're not supposed to be boxed. Um, but um, I think it was a lot of marketing around how to develop these icons, but also how to have something that is recognizable uh, and easy to remember. So, for instance, no poverty has nothing to do with no poverty. Uh, so you always need to look into the targets. So no poverty, uh, there are targets, one which says no extreme poverty. And another target is to um, reduce to half poverty. But even then, 
you need to ask yourself what is poverty, how what's the definition of poverty, and you need to go to the indicators. And most of that, unfortunately, is the World Bank approach, which is monetary. So poverty is defined as the number of dollars per day per person, per household, whatever. So, you know, it's fancy to say, you know, we are, we are going to achieve no poverty, but at best, it's going to be no extreme poverty um, and, and only monetary terms. In any case, so um, uh, the SDGs were adopted. Uh, they were part of the, uh, the global uh, document called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is about SDGs primarily. But there's also something very interesting, which I actually particularly like most, is the Leaving No One Behind, which is or LNOB agenda, which is really focusing on those who are the most vulnerable. And, and most of my work is actually uh, focused on that. Um, and I find it very interesting because um, focusing on the most vulnerable uh, actually facilitates quite a bit of system thinking. Because you're not going from the, you know, for the average, you're not going for the aggregate numbers. You're trying really to, to look into what's behind um, all these kind of reports. But I'll, I'll come back to Elena B later. Um, one thing that, again, now getting to the, to, to, to the kind of uh, proper understanding, the context. These boxes, these 17 boxes, are part of a document which is political in nature. So this was the result of negotiations amongst politicians and statisticians and bureaucrats. It was not like, you know, strategic thinkers, policy makers sitting together, having a proper dialogue or whatever. They were just negotiating as, as it happens at the UN, as it happens with multilateral uh, processes. Uh, and what, of course, ends up being the, the product is the, the minimum common denominator. So something that everyone or most of the people could agree on, both in terms of substance and uh, the formulation. So when people criticize the SDGs that they are not really, you know, what it should be, they reflect what global politicians, leaders, statisticians, bureaucrats uh, managed to agree upon in 2015, that that was their understanding of the world. Which, which we would probably agree that most of that is quite misleading and wrong and not really what it should be. But it is what it is. I mean, it, it cannot, you couldn't get further than that. Even that was very ambitious. And then the boxes, they combine the latest thinking in 2015. So it's, you know, seven years ago. Uh, around in these boxes and then put together. So whatever was the mainstream thinking around education, it was put in, into education. Whatever was mainstream, mainstream thinking about, you know, hunger and, and food systems and stuff was put into that box. So it was kind of a compilation of compilations, all based on the mainstream established thinking. So there was nothing really radical about any of that. But still, it became universal. So um, all countries uh, committed to implementing it, even Canada. We'll come back to that later on. And there was some sense of global coherence. So there was a global strategic framework saying, this is what everyone in the world will be focusing on for the next 15 years. And there was a narrative around that for the very first time. Um, I mentioned that goals, some goals are not really goals. Um, and the idea was to have it not radical, fundamental, transformative as such, but to create a sense of urgency. So many of these goals were never meant to be achieved by 2015, but they were formulated to push the world, or you know, at least those involved in the international development, the national development, to create something aspirational to say, you know, by 2015, you know, we'll, we'll exterminate the extreme poverty. So no one is going to be in extreme poverty on 1st of January 2016. But again, it has never been uh, as something considered feasible. So no one said that all 169 targets will be accomplished by 2030 by everyone in the world. So it was, it was a, you know, again, very political. And we can discuss that uh, um, further on, of course. So this was the basic kind of, you know, background. Um, I didn't want to go too far because I wanted to leave this for, this, for the discussion a bit more. Um, I didn't get into what sustainable development meal means and, you know, is this even, you know, a pro appropriate concept? Uh, and do we even need to have the goals? Um, 
but this is now for the discussion. So passing back to you, David, thanks. Thanks. Uh, so if people want to ask questions, um, please enter them in the chat. Um, so let, let me actually start with the question of global. <laughs> this is a big challenge. You have countries that are economically well off, countries that are less developed. And um, yes, it's all political. Um, is, is this more than politicians just um, trying to make a score? Is, is that the question for me? Or... Yeah, 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 that's a place to start. Yeah. When... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think it was, as I said, it was aspirational. It was something daring at the time. I think there was a lot of excitement because even in Canada, there's still extreme poverty, right? So a politician committing, just to focus on this one particular target, a politician committing to and extreme poverty, even if it's in monetary, even if it's like the narrowest of the narrowest of the narrowest meaning of poverty, I think it was quite daring at the time uh, by politicians to commit to those. So if, I would appreciate even that kind of commitment. Uh, there's less commitment today. We'll, we'll get to that in the third section. Um, but, uh, and this is very unfortunate, but I think this is, uh, you know, so if you compare 2015 where there was excitement, we're gonna do that, even again, very narrowly, very kind of, you know, not in the kind of system thinking that we would prefer. Um, today is much worse. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, it would be good to go back to 2015, uh, comparing to, to what's happening today. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to invite people to actually uh, speak their own questions. So, Mary, um, you had asked a question. Would you like to unmute and, uh, and uh, ask your question? Sorry, why were the goals achieved to be um, so? Why were the goals set to be achieved by the year twenty thirty? I, I think it was just uh, because uh, MDGs started in two thousand one and they were in two thousand fifteen. So of course, then you go two thousand fifteen, two thousand thirty. So there was no particular logic or kind of feasibility test that these goals can be achieved in fifteen years. It was just a. Uh, Kind of it, it, it's a time frame that it's not too long and it's not too short. So I think it was again just political uh, reasoning around that. Uh, but but there is a um, uh, sorry there is there is a there is a risk with these goals and this was also this also happened with the MDGs because if you make them aspirational, then at some point in time you're going to get disappointed, right? So you get excited and then when you as you reach the the the, the, the timeline you know the end of the the road. Then you start getting frustrated and disappointed. This is what's happening now. Halfway through, there's not one single country that is on path to achieving these goals, not even close. And things are getting worse. So setting the, 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 the time frame, which is like, you know, sweet spot, 15 years, not five, not 50, um, can also be problematic if you are too aspirational, because at some point in time, you're going to conclude you failed, even if you did some progress. Um, Elena has a question. Elena? Uh, <clears throat> hi. Um, what I was asking about was uh, the fact that some of these goals would seem to increase population rather than reduce population growth, which is exploding. And educating women seems to be the only um, goal that would seem to be uh, geared towards reducing a population explosion. Is that implied in the other goals? Then, thank you, Elena. Um, the, the, the problem with this, as I mentioned, is is a, it's a compilation of goals and targets and indicators. So, on, on the surface of it, there's some coherence, but even co that you know superficial coherence is again a compilation of different agendas. So, there's no one definitive answer to your question or and any other question which is why in the second section of, of this discussion, we'll get into the systemic approach or lack of it um, on how different goals and targets um, relate to each other because they are trade-offs and synergies. So I would say that uh, there's probably plenty of stuff in the SDGs that uh, go one way and plenty of stuff in the SDGs that go the other way in terms of the population growth. And by the way, these are global targets. I probably didn't mention this. So um, 
the, the idea was to have something global and then to bring it to the national level, so-called to nationalize it, which is an awful term, but better than downloading, which is another term. So every country was supposed to take these global targets, uh, goals and targets, and then identify which ones are the priority for the country and then modify them. Because, of course, these goals are not the same for Canada as it's for Rwanda or from the Philippines. Uh, this was done sometimes, but in Canada it was not done. And that would make things clearer as you bring them from a very generic level down to the national and then to do the same at the local level. For instance, in Canada, it was provincial level and even local level cities and municipalities. So things should have been clearer as you get down and then you see how these things relate to each other more and more in practical terms. Okay, Kelly? What? Like oh, you have a question. Would you like to ask your question? I did. <laughs> you typed did, in a did question. Did it actually go through to the bush? <laughs> yes. Would you like to ask your question? <laughs> I think I was just putting down a, a thought for myself. Um, it wasn't really thought out, but but just uh, just just seeing them in silos uh, and talking in a systems uh, systems thinking forum. Related back to sustainability, I, I, I certainly my experience. If we take a look at consumer products and, and manufacturing in Canada, over my professional uh, time, uh, certainly we were able to solve some of our environmental problems by offshoring uh, the goods and taking down industry. I was a bit disappointed to take a look at industry in terms of uh, the narrowness of the framing. Um, maybe, Kelly, we can go back to this in the se next section because I'm going to provide a bit critical approach to systems thinking, system practice, and the SDGs. Um, yes, I didn't so, even so please, know I asked please, you know, a question. No, 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 but, but that's good that you asked the, because that, that, that's the essence of the whole thing. I think you asked about did, did I reference 2030, 2050, or 2060. I referenced 2030. So it was the 15 years from 2016, including 2016, to uh, 2030. So 1st of January 2031 uh, should be a, a new world. Everything transformed and changed and, you know, we are all going, you know, around happy and, 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 and you know, we know poverty and all, all the rest of it. But um, yeah, 15 years from until 2030. Okay, Peter. Yeah. Um, hi, no, no, uh, might be the answer to this question might actually be the Secretary General, but who would be the most authoritative spokesperson to clarify uh, the you know, the SDGs and the 2030 agenda and to, to to speak for it authoritatively overall? And are there and are there UN designated NGOs that are working with countries or coordinating the program, or is it in what if, or is officially really within the UN? It's very much within the UN. Um, so I don't think there's one uh, authoritative spokesperson. I mean, of course, the Secretary General would, would be the, the, you know, the mouthpiece of it. I mean, he would say stuff. Um, but it's actually um, all the SDGs were divided among the UN agencies. There are 40 plus UN agencies, funds and programs, UN entities, as we call them. And they're custodian, another awful term, um, <laughs> very colonialist, uh, custodian uh, agencies. So for different SDGs, you would have one agency which is supposed to uh, report on this, which is supposed to provide support uh, to understanding uh, of this. So, for instance, you know, on education it would be UNESCO, for instance. Um, but the issue uh, with interpretation is that there's no one single interpretation. And there was, uh, I'll come back to this uh, in terms of the kind of more the generic uh, universalistic approach versus contextual localized approach uh, to the SDGs. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I, we can get back to this uh, issue of how you interpret and who, who speaks for the SDGs. And then the NGOs there, of course, NGOs involved, but uh, it, it's within the UN agencies. So UN agencies have the mandates for the custodianship um, to, to report, to support, to, you know, coordinate processes and involvement of others and stuff like that. Okay, Mary has a question, maybe a two part question, and then we'll move on to the uh, second part. Mary?
Why did the UN think that it was the best vehicle um, to house these goals um, when within the UN body there are uh, sorry countries and actors that don't adhere to these goals? Um, these goals seem like they are not of the country's interest um, to adhere to them. So why did the UN feel like it should be where these goals um, are, are living or are, 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 are steered? And um, my other question is, um, when have citizens and countries been allowed to vote on these SDGs? Thank you, Mary. So um, there's no global democracy and, and probably there will not be anytime soon for better or worse. So um, UN is the only global um, structure, institution, body that brings together ev every single country in the world um, around a wide scope of issues. Um, so I, 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 I don't understand, I, you know, I like what would be the alternative? There's no alternative to the UN. You can, you can go to different other bodies, but they're much narrow, much more thematic. So um, there's no other body. Uh, except the UN. Um, but at the same time, UN uh, rarely, if ever, makes uh, decisions or agrees on documents that are um, obligatory in terms of implementation. So all the countries that supported and everyone supported these SDGs, they did not sign in blood that they are going to implement those. So they just said, you know, we are committed, like the Paris Agreement or whatever. They, they just committed politically that they would, they would implement those. Um, so it was not that UN was imposing something. I mean, there's no UN without the member states. I mean, if you, if you don't have countries involved in UN, there's no UN. UN is just a platform, just a forum. forum. Um, and, but then it was upon these countries to engage with their own citizens, um, align with their own existing government programs and policies and funding and everything else to, um, as I said, nationalize or localize the SDGs. And that was not done much, at least not in the global north or so-called developed countries. It was done a lot in developing countries. You know, in many countries, there were, you know, hundreds of NGOs, grassroots, uh, thousands of people, millions of people, whatever, being involved in designing national SDG strategies or plans. Uh, but it was less prominent in, in, the, in the countries that are like supposed to be more democratic. Um, but again, these are not obligatory. No one's going to say, you know, why did, you know no one's going to punish anyone for not implementing those. It's just a global strategic framework that provided an opportunity for everyone to come together and talk in the same way. If that makes sense, Mary. Okay, let's move on to the second part. Okay, sorry, there was another. Okay, Mary, Mary, okay. Um, okay, so now introducing a bit, um, a link to the systems change. And this is my own perspective. So um, it's not official. I mean, I have the, the logo behind me uh, of, of the fund that where I work, um, but it's still my personal interpretation. So so don't, don't, don't quote me, even if, if this is recorded. Okay. So plenty of stuff, and I don't have the answers to, I, you know, I'm going to pose some of the questions. So I spent, uh, I think, a couple of hours with a colleague um, a couple of years ago, um, and uh, we were joking about um, this notion of indivisible. So in, in, when you read the 2030 agenda, it says that SDGs are indivisible, and then it says you have to blend them, integrate them, coordinate them, they're interdependent. So how can you have something, and I think this is a broader philosophical discussion, I suppose, uh, how can you have something indivisible, meaning that there are no separate parts, and then still try to bring parts together if there are no parts. So that's a side note, but you know, I always start with this because it's, it's one of the, you know, kind of the, I suppose, uh, underlying issues whenever you talk about um, these kind of strategic frameworks that are supposed to be systemic in nature. Um, so the, the idea that SDGs are not separate boxes, although they graphically seem to be so, that they are interdependence, in the interdependent, you need to integrate them. And integrating is kind of the UN lingo for saying systemic. So you have to work across sectors, across portfolios, across silos, break down the silos, across institutions, and you are supposed to be producing coherence 
in policies and finance. And there's plenty of lingo uh, on systems. There's a lot, even, even in, the, in the convention, 2030 agenda, and there are, these words are being used. So there are synergies and trade-offs, right? I mean, you cannot work on one goal or target without considering whether it's synergetic or, you know, we would say enabling um, or facilitating um, the progress on the other goals and targets, which is kind of synergies, or trade-offs that it's actually hindering the progress on the other ones. So, I mean, there, there are plenty of examples like this, but, you know, you increase um, production and, of course, it increases the environmental, negative environmental impact and stuff like that. Leverage is all over the place. So everyone's talking about leverage. You know, when you ask about the defi definition, not many really know. Catalytic impact, you know, you invest a relatively small effort and funding into proper entry points for systemic change, and then there's the boom effect. I mean, this is my, uh, you know, daily job. So we are supposed to be giving money to where someone, um, you know, demonstrated that if you give me $2 million over two years, I'm going to transform the country. So, so that, that, that's kind of the idea. And of course, catalytic is used as in terms of development, so actual policy goals, and also in terms of financing. So you invest $2 million, and there's like $200 million being um, leveraged uh, on that sense. Universal approach, and this is going back, to Peter, to your um, um, previous question. In my point of view, this idea that these goals apply to the whole world, even though there is assumption that you would need to adjust them to the national and local context, I, I find it very problematic. Uh, because there's a tendency to say, you know, there's one approach to rule them all, or, you know, um, that there are also, you know, that there's an actual app that applies the, an algorithm to, to help you understand how you're moving on the SDGs, which I find very problematic because, you know, I come from the, from the legacy of uh, complex social systems uh, thinking, uh, where, you know, it's not about extra extrapolation of past data into the future. It's not really about forecasting. It's not about just kind of improving a bit um, the current situation. It's, a, you know, transformative really means that you need, to, you need to really apply something that is very contextual. And maybe going back to Mary's question, it has to be done by, with proper involvement of the stakeholders. It cannot, cannot be imposed, not, not from, the, from the UN. UN is not imposing, but even from the national government. Uh, and then it's, it's a lot about reporting. So everyone cares about how do we report on this. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's really you know, less relevant what's behind, this, uh, the, behind the data. Uh, as I mentioned, some are misleading. Uh, what is good about having goals, targets, indicators, is that the, the scope is being narrowed. So you start with no poverty. Then you have a, a target reducing by 50% poverty and then eliminating extreme poverty. And then you have an indicators, which are, again, as I said, mostly monetary about how you do that. So it's fluffy in the, in the main definition and even in the, in the icon is just something misleading. But when you go down, the scope narrows and sometimes narrows very narrowly. So it's actually too narrow. But at least it's not really everything under the sun um, as the 17 goals um, initially may imply. Um, Indicators are actually problematic because there are one third of indicators. Uh, data doesn't exist. <laughs> data was supposed to be created. And that was also aspiration. So let's put these indicators out there and then let's start developing you know, data systems to collect them. But one third was not even considered um, measurable. So, so that, that, that's a bit funny. Um, it's it just kind of, you know, like, yeah, you shouldn't be measuring everything under the sun, but at the same time, if you say you're going to measure, you should be able to measure. So um, this, this, um, this diagram here is uh, probably the most famous, quote unquote, systemic diagram uh, on the SDGs. Uh, it was produced actually before the SDGs were, were kind of, you know, started implementation. It's called the network of targets approach. Uh, that was supposed to be initial thinking around how different targets, again, not goals, targets relate to each other. Um, but the problem was that, I mean, it was very reductionistic um, and, again, very generic. So these linkages are not the same in different countries or even within different countries in different localities. But it was supposed to be like the, okay, so if you want to work on the SDGs, you have to develop your network of targets for your particular context. This is the methodology, and then you move from there. And then you try to identify entry points, leverage, blah, blah. But the problem is that that was the only globally accepted methodology that exists. 
no one really moved beyond that substantively to a bit more com complex uh, um, uh, spaces. Um, and then the issue, can you work on all goals? I mean, everyone says you cannot work on one goal. Okay, so you have to work on a couple of goals because they're inter inter interdependent. But at the same time, can you work on all of the goals? Uh, there is one actually publication um, from 2018 that I, I consider the, 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 the most you know, relevant. Um, is uh, And it came from Norway. Uh, and they said, uh, depending on the entry points, depending on your pathways, the relationships between different uh, targets are going to change. And you cannot take all of the 169 targets at the same time. You have to select a limited number of targets that you focus on and then apply these lenses to see how they relate to others in your particular context. So they were actually making a strong argument against uni universalistic approach um, to understanding the interlinkages. Uh, now, when it comes to methodologies, as I mentioned, there's, there's only this kind of network of targets. Um, so as, as you can see in my presentation, there's a lot of lingo and there's a lot of good intention to apply systems thinking and practice. But at the same time, the reality is, is, uh, is not really reflecting that. Not least because, as we know, uh, systems literacy is very low. Um, it's low in Canada, let alone in some other countries. So methodologies, um, there's something called MAPS. Um, and actually, I was working on this quite a bit. I was doing a, a midterm review of the whole MAPS project in 2018. Um, so MAPS was the idea that you take the global goals and then you mainstream them which basically means nationalization or downloading. So you take those goals and targets and indicators, and then you rethink them in the national context. And then you do that again when you bring them to provincial or sub-central or local level. So you are not just taking the global goals as they are. Um, and then you try to uh, work on acceleration, which means kind of should, should mean at least a systemic approach. You identify entry points, you identify so-called accelerators and master accelerators, you identify bottlenecks and leverage, you apply mixed method combo is uh, applied in Latin America as a mixed method approach to, to maps. And then you have integrated policy support, which is how you actually work then on policy innovation, policy change, and mostly through transformative systemic theories of change. And there was, of course, the foresight idea. I produced a, um, a global foresight guide for the SDGs, which was not really about SDGs. It was just my own compilation of everything that has to do with the foresight. And, and there was some prominence of foresight at the beginning, um, but I think it was lost. Now it's being kind of, uh, you know, uh, recovered to some extent, but forecasting took over. And, and I think that, 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 that that's a huge problem for the SDGs because that, that was not the, the point, um, just to kind of maintain the, the status quo. Again, how do you work across goals and targets? No one really knows. There's no specific methodology to do that. How do you actually change systems? Almost nothing. And when I say almost nothing, I don't mean that there are no methodologies. There's nothing that is globally agreed and applied and kind of recommended. There's no guidance on how to do that. Uh, you know, how do you identify entry points, and all, the, all, the, all the rest of it. But I think uh, probably at the core of all of this is this whole dilemma that I think is, has been discussed in this uh, you know, community as well, is between the systems dynamic approach or what the limits um, to growth implied versus the, the quote-unquote loser in this kind of debate at the, you know, at the beginning, uh, which was the um, Ausbekan's predicament for the human uh, kind, which was around complexes. So can you actually set specific targets? Can you have a linear thinking, even if it's system thinking, but a bit more linear, towards achieving these targets? Or you have to understand the complexity in, in, a, in a very different uh, context. Um, and of course, I don't believe that you can change institutions and policies and societies only with so-called techno-economic thinking or rationality. You need social, normative, and political, if, if, if nothing else. So it, it's, I think it's quite a reductionist. LNOB actually uh, proposed a very good opportunity because they, and I always kind of advocated this, they give, um, provide an opportunity to do extreme case systemic design. And we can discuss it because... Uh, most of the funding and most of the focus is on the most vulnerable. On, on, one, on this, uh, this graph, is just one example of you know, people trying to figure out how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, but again, nothing was uh, accepted at, the, at scale. Uh, these are the uh, theories of change um, uh, from the programs that in my portfolio on integrated social protection and leaving on behind that uh, Peter has been analyzing. 
Um, I'm just giving some examples. It's not supposed to be readable. It's just uh, showing you that even when you talk about the theories of change, there's no agreement on what theory of change is and let alone what's how we should apply theories of change for the SDGs. So you see, I mean, four very different approaches to this from, I think, you know, from, from four different countries. And Peter can talk um, uh, 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 about, you know, some of his uh, findings uh, in the discussion, but it was really interesting to see. And, and actually, if you look into, into those very briefly, there are no SDGs. So most of them are just not related to the SDGs properly. That doesn't mean that these programs were not successful. All of the four really produced huge results. Uh, my portfolio of 35 programs uh, contributed to directly uh, to transformative change of 147 million people over two years. So plenty has been done, but whether that was just kind of, you know, done because it was done, there are good people on the ground, governments are interested, or because there are proper methodologies behind those, that, that's a whole different question. And then we, we had also, Ryan, work with us, Peter and me, on trying to figure out this, you know, uh, understanding the leverage point bottlenecks. And this is how it, this might look like at the generic level for only goals and, and selected targets. So, so the complexity of this is huge. So some criticism is maybe not fair because if you want to deal with all these, you know, 169 targets and then try to figure out the linkages, uh, it really becomes uh, um, um, quite, quite a challenge. So I'll stop here for, you know, I just want to introduce and then we can, we can discuss it further. Over. So um, more questions in the chat if you uh, want to uh, ask. And Peter actually has made a comment and he'll probably maybe have you back up some slides with Peter. Oh, that was just a comment for everybody picking up on, just like you've been posting comments, David, on, on extreme systemic design. It really is, uh, sounds intriguing that uh, we should- uh... Extreme case, I don't know if I put it wrong. Extreme <laughs> case, extreme case. <laughs> Extreme case systemic design, yeah. I mean, this is this whole logic. If you if you design things for a very narrow group of people, uh, where there is some some intersectionality. So I always give an example of you know whatever um, um, a woman who is also part of ethnic or religious minority, and maybe she's uh, she has you know disabilities and whatever. So if you design for that person, which is much more difficult and more expensive than to implement, then the, the whole idea is that you, the, the system would then, you know, provide um, uh, good uh, services to to everyone else. I mean, that, that uh, you know, yeah. in, in, in that shell. So similar to the perspective of the extreme user and satisfying the 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 range of extreme users, so that um, so that every everybody in the middle of those tails is also satisfied. Well, I see it as a as a, a problem of 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 the translation of the various targets to appropriate national or regional goals and contexts too. So it's extreme in the sense of the reach from these these very um, uh, you know these very aspirational or kind of high you know, um, um, you know so they're the SDGs and the targets are worded in ways that are that don't lend themselves to very effective evaluation. You know, they have to be translated to, as you've shown, theory of change, at least, you know, that's that's one kind of transformation of the program to be able to be able to manage it toward toward uh, progress and toward evaluation. But then to really translate it to community levels. Uh, so is it SDG 12 or like community development uh, level? That seems to be, you know, an extreme reach from, you know, the global goal to the actual support of the community. And so that is, that in the theory of change at least is somewhere in the middle, but to reach all the way down into the community is really a stretch, you know, so. Yeah, I think this is one of the main challenges because, again, the the formulations, global formulations, are not supposed to be actionable. I mean, they're just something that is minimum common denominator for everyone, you know, um, all the countries in the world. Then the whole point was to interpret those into different contexts. So at the national level, governments are supposed to be doing that. And, and many did, many did, uh, most in Europe. 
but also in Africa, Central Asia. Canada didn't. Um, and then you would bring it down to the local level, or regional level. Um, then, you know, private sector, corporate sector, people are complaining, well, these are bureaucratic goals, you know, from, for national statistics offices and stuff like that. Well, the point was that you take those goals and say how this relates to my own business. Uh, and then, of course, universities. I mean, many universities embrace this as well. So how does it relate to universities? And then grassroots and, and NGOs. And I've been working with some NGOs trying to figure that out. The problem is that there's no guidance that will help enable this process. You have to do it on your own, uh, or you just need to have someone who is very well informed about the SDGs and, and knows the local context. And, and, and there are very few people like that. So I think that the problem was that there was no guidance on how to do these maps, how to mainstream them or nationalize them or localize them. What acceleration means, there's no agreement on what accelerator is, and then how to actually organize an integrated approach. And then give this as a kind of a manual, and everyone then does it in their own context. But again, saying that these SDGs are not applicable to businesses or grassroots or universities or like municipalities is completely mis mis misunderstanding of, of the original intention. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think that's a really, uh, it, it, it's value, it would be valuable to have um, the proliferation of more case studies of the of, of uh, different and valid, of a variety of valid approaches to implementation that have been used, um, not just in national contexts, which I think would, could come out of the LNOP, um, you know, your work with the, with the LNOP um, program uh, across the different recipient countries that, that we actually analyze too with the theories of change. But, but for, you know, I know there are communities in Canada, municipalities that are attempting to, to work SDGs into their um, strategic planning so that they can have use those as um, aspirational goals for, and then was, uh, assign different indicators within their own more local strategies or local theories of change. Those are, um, you know, Griff and I have been, you know, part of a team that's been exploring different municipalities and we've come across some interest, some some interest in, in different municipalities in this, the extent to which they're able to develop anything we might see as a case study in SDGs is probably a few years away. I mean, so that the thing is that it starts to get caught up in all the, you know, all, all, you know, the local action can really take some time. So, you know, there's also rate, you know, you, you would think the closer you are to the ground, the faster things could happen. But it's probably, you know, not the case. And just the, even the understanding of what the SDGs are going to mean to a municipality, especially one that's already fairly well off, and it's trying to perhaps push, you know, even, you know, into goals that might be very, that might be very high minded for, you know, as like a middle class economy, you know, and a strong economy in a Canadian municipality or something. And so they're you trying to use these, I think, as reference points for getting, you know, a direction for, you know, for, for sustainable, you know, for, for sustainable uh, economic growth as they might think about it in these municipalities. But, um, but we're short on good guidance with case studies and then missing that guidance, you know, Nenad, as you know, um, people will start to believe that this is perhaps being imposed as a policy agenda by the UN or these, or this is kind of, you know, like the communities are indulging in globalism or something. And, and I, I think without having a good strategic position or narrative about, you know, the, about the application of, of, of the SDGs within a, a localized framework, um, people really, you know, I, I'm not sure they're, they're clear about you know what, what that's going to mean, and it might be different in, in each project and in each municipality. Yeah, I, I think uh, um, uh, Mary, Mary, you asked a couple of questions, so maybe I can I can respond to those as well, building on what uh, Peter said. But I think I think that, that I mean when we talk about the UN, I mean again, there's no UN without member states, which means that there's no UN without national representatives. So there's not something like you know people that there's secretariat of the UN where I sit. These people are not making these decisions. So I think that, that there's a lot of uh, 
uh, kind of um, um, failure uh, at the national part to communicate this effectively. Because if you, I mean, as it is per se, if you try to look at them objectively, they're really bad. <laughs> but if you use them as a, as a reference point, as you said, Peter, uh, if you use them as like, okay, so I don't start from scratch, I start, start with these, and then you start changing them to what you need, I think they can be very effective. One thing that I forgot to mention, it was on one of the first slides, is that actually before the Millennium Goals, before UNICEF was, I mean, Osbekan proposed CCPs, and Peter, you presented 50 years after the CCPs recently. I mean, CCPs are also kind of global goals. I mean, they are not goals meant to be measurable in the way that these are, but they are also kind of certain reference points that you take, at least this is my understanding, and then you work on it depending on your context. They are not prescriptive in, the, in that sense. So I think there was a, a lot of miscommunication at the national level, but that's, you know, we can discuss that in case of Canada, but I think that's not the case in most of the other countries. In Germany, for instance, I wanted to mention that later on, but I'll mention it now. Germany took the, I mean, before the SDGs were adopted, Germany conducted functional review of the whole federal government to uh, review how the federal policies and institutions relate to the SDGs and then introduce reorganization of the federal government and change the priorities. So they're not, they did not take the SDGs and then start implementing them. They use them as a kind of, a, again, a reference point to see how they align with something that has been emerging at the time. But, you know, this is Germany. And then in other countries, it was a bit uh, different. But I think the most problematic was is indeed, and going back to, to, to Mary's questions, is with the, with the private sector or corporate sector, whatever you want to call it. Because at the, at, at the very beginning, they just played dumb. And they said, oh, this, this has nothing to do with us. It's UN, it's the politics, it's the bureaucracy, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, actually, they are critical um, to, to the implementation of the SDGs because the funding and financing has to come from the private slash corporate sector. Governments cannot pay for the SDGs for the most part. And then there was a push that, you know, private sector, I'm going to call it private sector, although in Canada it's usually called corporate sector. But I, I mean, for profit, this is what you're talking about, for profit businesses. Um, and then they say, oh, no, no, yeah, we are looking on the SDGs. So what happened? And I was looking at some of the, you know, like RBC and a couple of other um, um, banks and, and, and companies here in Canada. They just, you know, just said, oh, we work on these three SDGs and we have ever, you know, we've been working on this forever. So they did not really do the M, mainstreaming. So say, okay, so we take 169 targets and, and we select 2030 that relate to our business. And we re redefine the indicators, of course. They just, they just said, oh, these three. We will of course, we look on gender and we look on poverty, whatever. Um, one, and there's plenty of actually um, examples. Uh, unfortunately, there's still divide between kind of developed and developing countries, but there's huge amount of, uh, practices, best practices, analysis, evaluations, um, um, all over the world in terms of the, you know different practices. Now, I'm focusing more on localization, actually going to the local level, and uh, you know we'll have a new thematic window on localization just starting next week. Um, but Mary, uh, the, one of the main organizations that was supposed to be collecting and bringing private sector together is called Global Compact. There is a Global Compact globally, and then there's Global Compact in uh, Canada. Uh, so they, they were supposed to be bringing, you know, all different companies together, discussing how SDGs relate to ESG, how it relate to this, and then developing, uh, you know, bringing, putting together data, you know, sharing best practices and, and stuff like that. But, you know, depending on the country, this, this was, you know, more or less effective. Uh, the reporting still um, becomes the mostly the, in Canada, federal government reporting through VNRs, which I'm going to mention later on. Um, so just to check, David, I suppose we need to move on. Just to check, Mary, I had some other question. Did the SDGs come with the point system? No, I mean, there's no... Um, so uh, the, the thing with, uh, again, SDGs are not obligatory. They're given, and, and I'm using, Peter, your, 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 your concept, which is reference, right? I think, you know, that, that's, that's a good communication uh, tool. To, so it's a reference point. Um, and then everyone was supposed to be doing it on their own and producing reports. So the reports um, that are produced at the national level are called VNRs, Voluntary National Reviews. And the first word says it all, it's voluntary. So it started with like, you know, dozen countries now, it's I think three, three dozen countries or so. So 
most countries do not report. Some report it once, and then uh, Canada reported once, and and it's supposed to, you know, uh, Canada is supposed to be reporting this year as well. But there's no again unified methodology of how to do that. There's like some guidance, but it's just very so. There are no SDG report per se that are obligatory that you would say point systems. However, that did not prevent many countries to actually use the SDGs as a framework for what unquote point system or something that they can use domestically to monitor and evaluate their own policies. It's just that most countries, you know, Canada included, did not really apply them. They're just like a like an appendix to what uh, you know are are regular strategic frameworks for at the national level. And I'll mention one uh, developed uh, you know by University of Waterloo uh, later on. Uh, I, I, Mary has more questions, but I think we're getting into the third category. So let's move to the third category and we'll have more questions at the end. We'll start off with Mary when we come back. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we already got there um, a bit. So where do we stand in 2023 uh, uh, and what happens next? So it's half a point. So it's seven years past and seven years, you know, ahead. Um, so first of all, as, as, as always, there's already discussion about post-2030. So you remember I mentioned post-2015, which was after the MDGs. Now there's already, because again, January, 1st January 2020, uh, uh, 2031, when the SDGs are supposed to be completely uh, accomplished, is not going to be a very happy day because, you know, there, there's going to be some progress, but it's going to be very disappointing. So there's already discussion about, you know, next 15 years, stuff like that. There was a decent progress until 2020. Uh, and I'm, ta I'm talking about global data, right? So globally, things moved a lot. But that was mostly the effect of development in China and then Southeast Asia and maybe some parts of Africa. So there were still countries that are lagging behind. And I just the other day I was looking, there are, I think, six, six or seven countries in the world that account for more than half of extreme poverty. So in six, seven countries, you have half of the extreme poverty of the whole world. So things did not move, you know, equally. But so, you know, there was progress, but it was a bit, uh, uh, you know, too aggregated. Didn't show that it's not really the whole world moving. But, you know, there, there was there was positive uh, attitude. And I mentioned VNR's voluntary national reviews. Localization of the SDGs was very important from the beginning, but not enough attention. Now it's we are bringing it back because this is where the outcomes, policy outcomes happens. I mean, federal ministry in Canada has nothing to do with actual outcomes. That they can do policies, but what happens in terms of actual change, SDGs or otherwise, it's at the local level. So more focus on localization has been um, um, made more recently. Now, as I mentioned, again, I, a lot of this stuff I already mentioned. So it was the whole point was to mainstream to adopt these frameworks to national, subnational levels, universities and CSOs. CSOs is the you know civil society organizations, which is NGOs, grassroots trade unions, and stuff like that. No country, even before 2020, was on the path to achieve them all. Not even Norway. Close, but not there. So already 2020, there was a feeling like, oh, you know, is it going to really happen? And of course, then it got much worse. And I, I have this particular formulation that we can always discuss. Uh, Peter and I sometimes do. Um, so it's not the impact of COVID. It's the impact of the bad policy response to COVID. Um, then, you know, consequent inflation, um, Ukraine um, and Western sections. And then what happened last year is something that was co still called triple crisis, which is energy, food and financing. Basically, most of the world is in, you know, in deep, deep trouble uh, because of the policy responses to COVID inflation, uh, Western sections so on and so forth. And now it's being called cost of living crisis. So with this, for the very first time, I think in 20, 30 years, the, the global development um, was going the other direction. Then, of course, that affected the SDGs. So things are now worse than in 2015 in many ways. Um, funding and financing, this idea of you know, mobilizing millions to mobilize billions to mobilize trillions didn't happen. And I don't think it's really about the money. If you put more money into the wrong system, it's not going to necessarily improve uh, or it's not going to have more transformative uh, change. And there's a lot of SDG washing, especially in the private sector. 
now there's the reference to SDG transitions or SDG transformations. Um, the three main ones are food, energy, digital, and there are some others. We can discuss those. And then there is a big summit in September this year, uh, halfway through, seven years left. What should be done to kind of bring, uh, there's actual uh, expression that we use uh, to rescue the SDGs. Uh, but it's not about the SDGs, it's really rescuing the, the, the development itself, not even the development itself, because it's, we are really, really regressing back to, I don't know, decades, decades back. Now, this is just an illustrative thing. So on food, things are much worse than, than it used to be. They improved by 2020, but then it became worse because of the, again, triple crisis on food, energy, and financing, which are interrelated. Um, so um, nearly one in three people lack regular access to adequate food. Even in 2020, now it's even worse. Um, on, on gender equality, um, I mean, th this, this goes back to what I said about aspirational. Even in 2020, and now it's worse, uh, it would take another 40 years for women and men to be represented equally in national political leadership. And that's a tiny, simplistic indicator of gender equality. It, it's about quotas. So even quotas would need 40 more years to be, uh, let alone actual substantive. Uh, equality. Uh, so this shows, but again, the whole idea was to have positive trend, right? To the things are moving in a good direction. And then after 2020, they went to the other direction. So it's, it's much worse. Or on the climate change, I mean, stuff that, that, you know, is being part of daily news already. Now, Canada and the SDGs. Again, I'm not, I kind of lost uh, a track of Canada for the past couple of years that I've been in New York uh, or working, you know, with the headquarters. Um, so uh, these are just uh, some of my insights. So first of all, there was very limited in interest in Canada, uh, even the U.S., not even, even more the U.S., because there were those U.N. goals. So this, this isn't ours. It's just some, you know, that, that's some bureaucracy in New York. Uh, but EU and U European countries really, really are all about SDGs. They, they have SDGs across all their policy documents everywhere. And I mentioned the German case of the functional review. Um, then Canada in 2000, but when I, when I, uh, I did a, I did, there was a panel I was participating in and I also wrote for government, Canadian government executive, I, I wrote an article um, on the SDGs, I think it was 2016 or something. Very few people heard of the SDGs, even in the government. And they, they were just, you know, it, it, it was non-existent in terms of uh, the narrative or discussion. But 2019, so you see three years later and three out of 15 years is, is, is a lot. Canada developed a strategy and there was some funding, but all of that is, in my point of view, very much a side note. It's an appendix. It's not mainstream into the Canadian federal government policies. And if you look at the, where the SDGs are explained in the government website, it's under employment and social development. So it's not under prime minister's office. It's not under something. It's just one quite narrow silo. And this may, might indicate how Canadian federal government sees the SDGs, you know, it's, it's jobs and social security or something like that. Uh, VNR uh, won international review in 2018, uh, which is again, before the strategy. So it's a bit, doesn't make sense. You know, you're like you produce a report, you don't have a strategy. Yeah. And then uh, this year, apparently Canada should have the next one. Data is quite outdated. Like if you look at the, uh, I shared the link and David shared the link. If you look into the extreme poverty, the data is from 2016, that, that's ridiculous. Like that, that's, that's just useless. Um, universities, and there's, there was some traction, some, some at the local level. BC, provincial elections a couple of years ago were all about SDGs. I don't know what happened later on. Interestingly, uh, Alberta was very much interested in the SDGs. Um, and, and at some point in time, most of the traction, even in the, in the private sector, um, on the SDGs was taking place in Alberta. All the conferences, all the discussions, what actually in Calgary, for maybe obvious reasons, but still, this is where the, the center of SDG discussion in Canada used to be some years ago. And then, of course, there's a lot of washing. So this is just one example. So there are all different kinds of strategic frameworks. So one of those that is used in Canada is this the Canadian index of well-being. And you can pick and choose. Of course, you can say, oh, I work on this one, not, not on the SDG. This is a, an attempt from University of Waterloo to relate SDGs with this uh, Canadian index of well-being. The benefit of the SDGs is that this is global. So if you talk to other countries, if you want to exchange experiences, if you want to compare notes, you can talk in SDG terms, but you cannot talk in terms of Canadian index of well-being because this is Canadian and others have different one. But then 
do you want to use the SDGs for the for the local purposes? Um, I would still go for something that is globally as a reference point. Peter, I'm, I keep using this word, uh, rather than inventing something on my own, um, and then investing a bit more in socializing that with people, uh, rather than just trying to invent this even more complicated uh, comparative frameworks. But again, that, 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 that's a good attempt. And as I mentioned, University of Waterloo is, has been really serious about the SDGs for, for a while and is known globally as, as one of the centers of excellence in this. So this is the end of the third part. Over to you, David. Uh, so uh, Mary and Peter have stuff going back and forth. Uh, would Mary like to step up and then Peter will respond to that? <laughs> Sorry, I I just um, I I've been following the SDGs um, and I've actually been involved in um, a hackathon uh, at one of the uh, local colleges regarding this um, and with the municipality and pitching uh, ideas. But the thing that um, I remember when I first read them when I was first following the news about them and now all of these years later I'm still keeping you know my eye on what's going on but it just the initial um, my initial thoughts um, many years ago when it was presented haven't really changed because I feel like fundamentally at the start that there were i don't know like gap gaps that there were gaps on the way um in the way that it was being implemented um and for me then and even now it just did not seem like their goal of this 2030 or like every 10 to 15 years um it didn't seem that that was um achievable and even now it doesn't seem that it is achievable and as a young person then and as a young person now it one of the things that really bothered me was that um it it did not it it seemed like they they needed such huge buy-in um and cooperation but that maybe this was not this was not the way to, to, to do this, this type of work that they're trying to do. Um, and anytime you were asking questions about like, even how they themselves as, as the UN or even as their own countries, individual countries, how they get, um, they get their plans passed through, it didn't seem that though, the, uh, th that type of, um, that type of thinking went towards these, these goals. And if you are like a young person and you're seeing that, th that there is a way, um, an actual path um, that, that can be implemented to kind of like change the future and to change the future outcomes, um, you, you kind of get hopeful and you, 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 you buy in, right? So a lot of young people, young kids, uh, university students, college students, all around the world, we bought in to these ideas, these goals. Um, but it's many years later, we're not closer, and I don't think we're gonna be any 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 closer. So I think that there there were flaws. There were, I, I think what you guys are discussing here, there were system thinking flaws that I feel like the same people who, who came up with this um, knew about or would have known about then and more should have been done then to kind of um, per perceive it going, like per perceive it on, on the outset, right? So for me, it just, <laughs> it just, it, it doesn't really ring, ring true anymore. And I don't know if, 
if people really understand that they're they're letting um, a lot of the goodwill that was there previously and that should be there and even now that a lot of younger people are kind of like really down <laughs> down on this 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 future change like like we don't actually think that it's something that can happen you know what I mean so that that's just what I'm talking about or thinking about as, as I'm here thank you Alva. Um, I, and I, I fully agree with you I fully agree with you um, it, it just it's thinking in terms of again that's why I emphasize so much the context before 2015 or even before 2000 let's say MDGs provided some context it was very difficult to to talk about development, sustainable development, all this kind of stuff uh, across countries. Uh, you default to talking about the G GDP, right? And that that's the worst possible discussion because GDP is, should be the, the least relevant um, of them all. So comparing to what we had before, this is huge. Is it ideal? No, and I and I kept criticizing it. Um, did it change um, in terms of the, uh, you know, seven years ago? Yes, but I think the failure is not on the SDGs so much as it is it at the national level, at the local level, and in the private sector, corporate sector, uh, you know, grassroots that did not understand them properly, did not embrace them properly. Uh, uh, one of the challenges, and this I think we have in systems in general, is the, 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 the overwhelming effect of 17 goals, 169 targets. But I think the message is that you cannot work on one without thinking about the other ones. And, and I, I don't think the message is, you know, everyone should work on everything. I mean, it's just impossible. So applying personal lenses, whether it's individual, and I, yeah, I think, you know, um, David wanted to discuss what we as Canadians individuals can do as well or business lenses, or local lenses, or whatever, I think that's essential. If that fails, then, then it can be misleading, and it, it, it's just missing the point. Um, but again, comparing to what we had before, this is really, really important. I am very concerned about the um, default to forecasting, uh, because there's less aspiration about the future. But again, this has nothing to do with the SDGs. This is all the um, effect of the you know, policy response to COVID, um, inflationary um, uh, kind of trends, um, sanctions uh, against Russia, the decoupling, geopolitics. There's so much happening that really has nothing to do with the SDGs, which I, I believe are at the cause of this current uh, lack of a more aspirational uh, perspective towards the future. And I think we are getting into something that you know didn't exist for decades you know closing of the countries more nationalistic more authoritarian systems all that kind of stuff that again are very different from the baseline the starting point in 2015 for the SDGs. i don't know if, if this makes sense um but but you know again I, i'm the first one to be critical about the SDGs, but i see the value huge value if you apply them properly David, do you want to check some of the other questions? Uh, so, so Peter was mentioning about movement and movements. Um, could you uh, speak up a little more about that, Peter? Well, yeah. Let's see. To clarify um, what's meant by that, there. Well, I'll, I'll go back. I'll, I'll, I'll tie this into the discussion by saying that um, when uh, Ryan Murphy and I uh, worked with uh, Nenad a few years ago on on uh, essentially evaluating the process for how theories of change were being developed and, and looking for some of the best approaches to theories of change that were coming out of the proposals for, you know, from, from the different countries in the SDG fund. And then Ryan and I were, are, you know, have been working on kind of a joint project through different methodologies <clears throat> um, in what we call systemic theories of change. And so taking an approach to theories of change that would account for sy uh, systemic action and outcomes that could be um, understood from the design of that theory to its evaluation, to the ways of working with that theory of change as a type of systemic, a more systemic strategy rather than 
this kind of somewhat linear looking magical set of set of outcomes that lead to you know the 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 achievement of the SDGs if even that like Nenad had said um had pointed out that even in that small sample of different um um kind of graphical or logic models of theories of change that very few of them even included the SDGs that were were part of their impact strategy their ways of showing how they're going to imagine success for their national programs in a sense and they're and they're coming up with a you know story of impact for that and it's kind of that's one of the systemic issues as well you know you're assuming which sdgs <laughs> you know because this is on the no one left behind and social protection which I, I think is really a good place to start and 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 also to even address mary's questions like well we don't even know really the long-term impact of 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 this kind of front the front loading if you will of just the social protection aspect of of the sdg funds program i mean this is good for every country that's doing work on you know um you know on 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 mother and child um protection on it and on educational services and social benefits and in protecting you know child development in different in different uh, very often even in very um rural or traditional contexts like you know sheep sh sheep herding families in mongolia and things you know it's a it's a wide range of things that's that's meant by by this leaving no one behind and it may not achieve all the sdgs but it's going to have systemic impacts that um, some of which can be somewhat foreseen not forecasted but oriented towards and some of which are going to be invisible to all but those that are really part of those programs so there is like good being done whether or not it all is like part of the agenda that's like you know more the political question so the the idea of these different models of theories of change were uh, this is a uh, this is an aspect out of classifying the different um theory of change models that were being used and also to distinguish the ones that might have more um systemic impact and so we, so I've written about this some and basically can just summarize there are four different sense making logics for theories of change the 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 fairly traditional theory of change that actions lead to outcomes lead to <clears throat> impacts call that action outcome and that's like the traditional logic model we have um, influence pathways which is like strategic pathways or approaches to tracing pathways to change um one we called process complexity because we just needed a place to bundle all the ones that were interesting in a complex way but may have had their own internal logic but no common structure but they were processes that attempted to account for complexity for their outcomes so there was a some attempt of systems thinking and then there's movement coordination and the movement of movement is one actually that foundations have been interested in pro probably more than even the sdg program which really should be looking at this more but the movement of movements is one where it's more laissez-faire in terms of the attempt to coordinate it it's kind of putting the strategy into the hands of of the overall movement assuming that there are many different um, it's like equifinality in Bertolanffy's terms. There are many pathways that can get to a similar to the same outcome, and that the foundations are interested in funding uh, perhaps high leverage projects that might cost them less but have more impact because they're part of an ongoing movement, a social innovation movement, a new economies movement, a reduction in poverty movement. And so they take advantage of the social movement aspects, the fact that other foundations that they're talking to are funding other major projects. And so a large foundation like Omidyar might fund like $5 million, $10 million projects, and McConnell might come in in Canada and fund five, you know, half a million, $1 million projects over an extended period of time. And those would be part of that same movement. And then they would look for kind of cooperative effects to occur as as they use 
things like developmental evaluation to not just really to measure progress, but developmental evaluation is used to inspire progress where progress is, is starting to happen. So it's looking across a range of outcomes and then and then and then reinforcing progress where it's starting to show up. Movement of movements is quite a bit about you know that approach. And unfortunately, Donald seems to have backed off from that. That was part of their big push towards system change. Uh, um, right, Ted Hutter's and Tim Draymond's last few years there, and there are new people running McConnell now, and they're taking more of a traditional approach, you know. But there was really a, a real kind of push there at the the end of um, Ted and, and Tim's tenure to, you know, really build on this kind of approach to systems change. And I think this is also, you know, something that we're seeing in some of the SDG programs. Uh, David, yeah, may I? Three, I don't know, I think we are out of time, but maybe three quick questions, if you allow. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so we have like 10 or 15 minutes. So um, there was one question from Maxime, and then I actually wanted to return to what's on the slide because we haven't discussed those. So for people who haven't spoken, if you'd like to put in questions in the chat, I will respond to them. Uh, but Maxime had asked a question, could you please speak a bit more about what the SDG transition could look like in the coming decade? Yes. Thank you. Um, and just before that, maybe to, to go back to Mary and some of the previous discussions. So I think one of the challenges with the SDGs are, have nothing to do with the SDGs. It's the challenges with you know complex system change. Um, and, and I think systems literacy is one of the reasons why SDGs by themselves were not embraced effectively and more widely. So when you see you know 17 goals, 169 targets. How do you deal with this kind of complexity? How do you avoid being overwhelmed? Um, well, you know, you find you try to find entry points. Where do you find it? Depends on what your you know strategy, policy, what's your mandate, where do you work, and so on and so forth. What's your business? But you could take gender-based violence. You say, okay, so there is an NGO grassroots working on gender-based violence. So the whole idea of the SDGs is to say we are not narrowly, we are not issue-based uh, approach, but we are looking into the broad spectrum. So how the uh, gender-based violence relates to poverty, how it relates to education, how it relates to health, decent jobs, uh, you know, whatever, environmental um, 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 change. Um, and then you zoom out from there and try to figure out what's your kind of, you know, how do you look at all these SDGs? Or, you know, to, to bring it back home to, in, to Canada is like, okay, so extreme poverty. So we want to eliminate extreme poverty, whatever that means. So how does that relate to other um, goals? So it, it's kind of, it's even if you want, if you would want to do some sort of foresight and then compare, do the wind tunneling of your alternative scenarios of the future against the SDGs as strategies, you know, this could be a way to do it. The, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is that um, this, uh, again, um, as you, David, mentioned, uh, um, the SDG transition. So sometimes, Politically speaking, again, and a lot of that is politics, uh, at least uh, the context, is to try to push the agenda that kind of died a bit. Because with the, with the post-COVID situation, the situation is so bad. I mean, I've been in this space of strategic development for 20 plus years. I have never seen that in even, and I've worked in many problematic countries. Um, just recently, we were doing a survey and we were talking about food systems, which is the first, let's say, the first transition. And governments around the world are saying, no, 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 we cannot work on food systems change. And the food systems approach is that you don't look only in agriculture, you look into the climate change, you look into jobs, you, look, you know, you kind of do mini SDGs around food systems, if you wish. Uh, governments are saying we cannot, we don't want to work on, SDG, uh, on food systems. We'll deal with this later let us address the current food insecurity crisis. And this is what happened with COVID. Oh, let, let's, let's finish with this COVID thing and then we are gonna do systemic change and that it never happened. So I think the SDGs at least should send us the message that, well, it is exactly during the crisis that you should be thinking about system change. You cannot wait for some you know, ideal situations to, to start thinking about something more substantive. So SDG transitions are a way to articulate this new push for the SDGs. The, the, the three main ones, and then there are something called transformations, something transitions, but the three main ones around the food systems, which is probably the most important one, it has to do with, again, it's like 
a subset of SDGs. So it's not only about food security. It's, and then uh, there is a huge food systems crisis in Canada. I mean, huge, not only in terms of the, the cost of land crisis, but also the agriculture. This, I mean, Canada could just say, okay, so for the next 10 years, we focus on, on food systems and, and that would be a very aspirational. Um, the second one is around digital transformation, which I have, you know, I have a digital background, uh, but I have second thoughts about this. But the idea is that, you know, digital is this kind of driver of, for change or whatever. Um, and then the third one is, 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 is around energy and, and uh, slash climate. So it's mostly about energy, uh, renewable energy, energy access, access to energy, and kind of this energy transformation area. Uh, but of course, it's it's close related to the climate, and then there is a kind of human well-being, like a fourth transition. But the idea, maybe teleolo teleological a bit, is that there's some point in future where we need to be, and we are transitioning into that, which again I don't like very much because there's no such point in future for all of us. Um, but uh, again, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, an attempt to push the the, the agenda further. David. Um, so let's take a little bit on the last question. What can we do as individuals and Canadians? Are you asking me? <laughs> yes. Uh, although anyone else that wants to chip in, uh, I think you're the authority here. So you get the heavy questions. <laughs> I, I, I really think that, you know, as individuals, well, there's always, you know, some advocacy for the SGs, but I think it's more individuals within the organizations, I would say. So it's the organizations that, that uh, you know, different people are part of, whether it's, you know, in their own businesses or, you know, corporate sector or working for the government or for grassroots. I think this is where the idea... So for me, SDGs are a good entry point to start talking about systems change, if you do it properly. So you start thinking, you know, okay, so, you know, synergy trade-offs. So what do we mean by that? And you start, you know, to create dialogue around that. Um, leverage, what's, what's leverage? What's catalytic, you know? And, and I've been involved in a couple of NGOs here in Canada. And when you start creating this dialogue, they don't get very far, but they move. And they, they kind of break through some of the, um, the, the, the kind of uh, the, the previous situations. So, you know, just talking about catalytic investment. So what does it mean to invest in a catalytic way across different sectors or industries or areas or policy domains, what does it even mean? You know, so, so we put one dollar there and we expect to do something, which is like this catalytic boom effect. So for me, um, as Canadians, I think we should be embracing a bit more systemic thinking and practice and as it is an opportunity for that. And the second thing I would say that to be uh, less navel gazing, because when, when, at least in my experience when you know people discuss here in Canada international best practices experiences they compare notes with other countries it's mostly US UK and maybe Australia um, and none of these countries are really good examples on almost anything <laughs> my personal opinion um, and certainly not on the SDGs um, and then there is certain resistance to not only go wider in discussing these issues but also resistance to understanding that a lot of good ideas, practices, even emerging practices, if not actual successes, have been done in countries that are much less developed than Canada. Um, I can give you just my example. I've, I've, I've worked in some 40 countries. Can, I mean, I would never even try to do things that I did elsewhere in Canada because it would be just impossible. It, it's so... Uh, so, so kind of um, uh, fixated um, in, in one place. So when you look into a small country, like, you know, Peter was talking about Mongolia. Okay, so Mongolia, who cares about Mongolia? Oh, they have herders, who cares about herders? But if you make parallels between herders and some indigenous populations that live in, 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 you know, in the Northern Territories, and you look into how Mongolia managed to transform childcare uh, within two years, well, you could you could be inspired, at least if nothing else. But I think that there's some some firewall there for for many of the Canadians uh, when they when they think about you know what experiences they should look at uh, from from other countries. But again, only my experience. Maybe it's it's very narrow. 
Okay. Um, just in closing, I'm going to actually do the last shot, which is uh, since you've now uh, motivated me to actually look into uh, into this more, I've actually been paying attention to um, the work in the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Um, and so they, uh, so Bjorn Lomberg is on a campaign with a book and um, the target is actually the fall. And so he's kind of leading up to it. Um, so I think that we're going to be hearing more about the SDGs. Um, there was actually a uh, interesting two hour Jordan Peterson interview uh, with Lomberg. And so um, some of the things came out were surprising. It was kind of like malaria. It's like, you know, if you look at the ROI, now he's now the interesting thing about Lomberg is that he's doing it as an economist and doing consensus work and just saying, you know, ROI on fixing malaria would be good. Um, ROI on uh, providing uh, some of the um, childbirth uh, equipment so to reduce those mortalities. Um, and so uh, given that I'm learning and going up this curve, just like everybody else, I'm kind of curious because um, Copenhagen Consensus Center has been around for a while, and this is actually a personal opinion. Uh, what do you think about what they're doing? Uh, I don't know so much about them, but I did actually watch that interview with Jordan Peterson. And um, I think, uh, well, whatever people may think about Jordan Peterson, uh, of course, but but I think it's there, there is a there is a tendency. Um, in the development sector, whether it's national or international, to take too many things as givens, as kind of even holy cows, right? And that, I think, kills debate, kills dialogue even more, uh, prevents innovation. So when we talk about climate change, for instance, there's so much that has to be discussed, not challenging the climate change, of course, but discussing rather than just kind of imposing or, you know, uh, kind of directing from the above, from the outside. And, and for whatever reason, these kind of discussions or even less dialogues are, are less and less um, uh, uh, happening less and less recently. And, and around the SDGs, we should, I mean, I think we started, uh, uh, Alana was asking about, you know, human population, growth of the population. Well, why not discuss that? That, that? That's a holy cow. You cannot discuss human population. I mean, that, that's no, 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 right? Well, we should discuss it because it has impact across almost every single SDG target. So I, I like this, this what, what they are doing um, uh, because at least they are asking questions and they are legitimate because they, this guy was involved in the UN discussions. I mean, he's not some, you know, some conspiracy theorist, whatever, you know, on, on the side. I mean, he, he knows stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me also, you know, the whole idea about what really cause, causes currently a uh, food crisis in the world. You know, are we going to open the box of the industrial agriculture and its impact on the climate and then not go into digital agriculture because it's going to be even worse? Not going into more GMO because it's going to be worse for the environment. I mean, there's so many things to be discussed. So actually, I like the just because it gives me an opportunity to say, oh, what about this, right? So to, to, to open another uh, box and try to, you know, um, go into, into that and then discuss the linkages. But again, I, I appreciate every time I see a different perspective, even if I don't agree with it, because I suppose that's the whole point of dialogue. Thanks. Thanks for that. And I think that um, this conversation we had today is a good beginning. I don't think it's the end, but my feeling is that the big the newspaper headlines are going to start coming in September, October. So I encourage people to uh, keep reading, paying attention to the SDGs. And I think that the conversations are going to come back. So thanks, Ned, for uh, providing your expertise. Um, uh, we are working on future uh, System Thinking Ontario sessions. Um, I'll tell you that actually I'm, I'm working, uh, I, we have July um, kind of um, uh, planned out and we have August kind of planned out. Um, if anyone has an idea for June that they want to press, I'm open to hearing that. Um, I have an idea, but um, uh, that would mean me, I'm leading the discussion, which I prefer not to do. So, um, so thanks, Ned, um, and we'll see everyone. Uh, watch out for your announcements for next month. Bye. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day, evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ned. David, see you, bro.